Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone, to The Things We Know. I'm Carrie Morin. And I'm Lisa Callahan. And today we have a special guest that I am so thrilled about, Noyland Mendoza. We have been friends and working together for, gosh, we were trying to just figure out for the before we started recording, probably about four years. We mm -hmm. started um, when you were a student going through your master coach certification at the Health Coach Institute. And then we became, well, like, I, I know I've said this to you before, but I'm going to say it again. Literally the minute you came on, you know, you just have that moment sometimes with people. And from the minute you came on screen with me on Zoom, I was like, I love her. And then luckily you don't live very far away. So we get to see each other on a regular basis. That's awesome. Anyways, that I remember you saying that about her and it is awesome to see you here in Neuland. Thank you for having me. We're so excited. That's All right. So, so Neuland's got quite a background. So hold on to your hat, settle in with a little cup of tea. <laughs> Neuland <laughs> Mendoza, as I said, is a certified life and leadership coach, business and orga organizational strategist and a professional pranic healer. That's my favorite part. But her real title is she calls herself a soul purpose coach, which I love. Mm -hmm. Noyland specializes in supporting Black, Indigenous, and people of color change makers who've lost their way and want to reignite their dreams. She's your bold dream navigator and champion, helping you shift from fear to action so you can start living the life you're truly meant to live. Her journey has taken her through 18 years in the public sector, advocating for immigrant health care access in New York City prior to starting her business, The Radiant You. And Noyla knows firsthand how easy it is to put others' needs first and forget about your own dreams. She now guides individuals at a pivotal, pivotal, <laughs> pivotal <laughs> moment in their lives to imagine again and rediscover their purpose. Oof. Wow. And since 2017, Noyland has been a catalyst for hundreds of individuals, helping them tap into their creative potential, find newfound clarity, and discover new possibilities. She's also the host of Unlock Your Inner Creator, where she dives into enlightening conversations with brave pathfinders who dare to explore fresh ways of living, being, and doing. And when she's not empowering people to step into their greatness, Noyland engages in epic dance-offs with her kids, <laughs> tends to her burgeoning green thumb, and continues to her quest to fill her passport with stamps. She and her family live in sunny Southern California. Welcome, Noylin. Thank you for having me. It's not so sunny, as you all know. We've been having a lot of rain lately. <laughs> we have, although today it's gorgeous and you can see as far as the eye can see, which I love after LA rain. You know, yeah. we've wanted to have you here for a long time. I mean, the pod is just now a year old and I've been talking, Carrie and I've been talking about having you on pretty much since the beginning. Um, and I'm sure, I know for a fact, we won't get into all the things that we want to talk about with you today, generational healing, rewriting your family legacy, cultural and community power, reinventing yourself in a second career, money is medicine, energy amplifier, what money teaches about yourself. I mean, literally, you have your hands in so many areas of life, which is what makes you such an amazing, empowering healer and coach. Um, so let's just start with generational healing. Can you start by sharing your own journey that led you to this work? Ooh, where do we start? Um, <laughs> I, first of all, I will say this, and I think a lot of coaches say this, we would have never imagined that we would be doing this work. I can say that for a fact. Like if you were to ask little old me, like at five or six years old, I, mm. I wouldn't have been like, oh, I'm going to be a coach. I don't mm -hmm. even know what that was, right? My my idea of a coach literally was like baseball team, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yelling, I'm telling you how to play. Um, so I became a coach, as you had mentioned in, in 2017. I I worked for almost two decades in the public sector, specifically around healthcare. And I got into healthcare honestly because my mom got sick and I didn't understand why. So um when I thought of healthcare growing up, I, I thought it was like, you can only be a doctor, a nurse, like very, very traditional understanding of what healthcare is. And then um, I got really into sports. When I was younger, I was I was a track star and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Like, what can you do with, with like athletes? And um, somehow learned you could be a physical therapist, you can work with athletes. So that's the route that I was going. And then when I was in my second year of college, 
Um, it's crazy to say this now because I'm not too far from this age. My mom was 49 mm. and had gotten really sick. So she developed Bell's palsy mm, and her wow. face just like out of nowhere, just if you're familiar with that, it's like, uh, it just like all the muscles just came down. Yeah. Right. And it's scary. Got, it's scary. It was super scary. And she's like, what's going on? And, um, what we realized the doctors were like, Oh, we don't know where it comes from. And now as an energy healer, there's like some symbolism in that. But part of it is I found out later um, is that she was just under a tremendous amount of stress, mm. right? So she was she was raising these kids, me and my brothers, right? And she was literally like sandwiched in between taking care of us and then taking care of our elderly parents. And we didn't really call it that back then. Like we no, are there wasn't Gen even X, a term, right? right? Gen X is, talks about being the sandwich generation, yeah. but your mom was clearly a sandwich generation. Yeah. She was a sandwich generation, right? And like many boomers, right? She just like did the thing. She yeah. was like doing work. And I just couldn't understand it, right? Because I was like, my mom had health insurance. She's bilingual. You know, we're straightly middle class. And I was like, why is she getting sick? at such a young age. Right. And then we also thought, I was like, was it just Bell palsy or like, did she have a slight stroke? Was it a mild mm. stroke? Right. Because after that, she was like developing all of these like conditions, you know, these chronic conditions, like high blood pressure, um, you know, high cholesterol, all of this stuff. And it just didn't make sense to me. And then I got exposed to uh, public health. Like I had, like I said, I had no idea that there was this whole other part of health and wellness that wasn't just a clinician. And I took this community health class and I was like, I'm hooked, I love this. Like it was actually looking at the totality of what can impact your wellness. Mm. And so that's where I first started getting interested in public health. And then it led me to move to New York City because I was getting my master's in public health. Um, and when I got my master's, I feel like I'm always just put in like these random places, right? For a reason. Um, it was my second year of my master's program and then 9-11 happened. Mm. And I was like, what is going on? And I just, you have to do like a capstone project where you have to do an internship for so many hours when you get your master's. And I was working for a immigrant rights organization and they had just started their, their health unit. And then suddenly I was thrust into helping my director um, do all of these trainings because all of a sudden now um, there was all these like restrictions lifted and all these people can suddenly get healthcare services if they need it like formerly um, uninsured people immigrants like not all immigrants have the same kind of access um, right. to certain types of healthcare and so that really exposed me to like the social justice part mm. and it was great because I was like wow I feel like I'm helping people who look like me and my parents and I'm starting to really understand health. It's not just the absence of disease, but there's so many things that impact, you know, and like, I really started to understand the impact of stress. Mm, I was like, yeah. Yes, of course, my mom, <laughs> yeah. got sick because there's all this stuff that was like, like, like she was carrying yeah. um, and what stress does to the body. So I did that for a few years and it was such meaningful work, but part of it is, um, is that you're always fighting something. You're fighting the system that has wronged a lot of people. And that was super difficult because it's like, yeah, you're doing meaningful work, but part of you, you cannot do that. Your nervous system cannot be in this fight mode all the time. And I was starting to see it. And honestly, like in my late, or no, my mid thirties, uh, you know, I was very career oriented. And then my husband and I were like, you know what? I think we want to have a family. and 35, I was like, I'm gonna have family. It just gotta happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so arrogant. <laughs> I could just be like that, right? <laughs> I got a humble piece of pie because I um could not conceive. Mm -hmm. And it was like on one end I couldn't conceive, and then on the other end, it was like you're like your doctors are telling you you are on a timeline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? You are on a timeline. And I think a lot of stuff just came to a head at that point where um work no longer became something that I wanted to do. Mm. And I knew it for a really long time. I was like, I'm good at this. I know it. I'm acknowledged by my colleagues. I'm running this huge coalition and helping all of these people. 
get access to healthcare, but I am literally in the worst health of my life. Like wow. physically, I was always exhausted, mentally drained. Um, and when I say like I was broken, like I was literally broke, like financially broke because you work in a nonprofit. So I remember hearing an episode with Carrie. I was like, you know, right? Like, um, and a nonprofit like, salary and history. Like, yeah, I just felt so like, is this it? Like, this cannot be it. But I stayed on for a really, really long time because I didn't know anything else. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I ended up leaving when I had my first child. And so I always just say, my kids are like the biggest teachers. And if they're going to mm. move you, they're going to be the ones. It's like business and having and becoming a parent are the two things that are oh, like, yeah. boom, here's a mirror. Everything you need to work on or everything that you need to be proud of, I'm going to show you right now. And when I had my first kid, I realized I cannot do this. You are in total misalignment. And I had gotten so sick, like I, I cannot move on. And I remember like a couple of years before that, um, I had my first coach because I was in a leadership program. And I was like, what is this? What is that? What is a life coach? Right. But this woman, Erin, I credit her so much because she really was like, where are you finding moments of just being able to replenish yourself. And I was like, I don't, mm. I don't even know. Like, and it just dawned on me. There were so many things that I loved when I was younger. Like I loved art and I loved to draw and I had no creative outlet because I was just working all the time. And she was like, I think you really need to think about that. And then I realized I was like, I shouldn't be here. Mm. I really shouldn't be here. Um, and because she helped me so much, I was like, I would love to do this for other people. And that's when I started uh, HCI because I would see these ads because I was yeah. like, well, how's it to be a coach? And then they, it just kept coming up. And I was like, oh, okay, we'll have a background in health. It would make sense that I'd be a health coach. So I went there, I got my certification, but I didn't really do anything with it. And it, like I said, it wasn't until I had my son mm. and I was like, I cannot return to work. I just can't mm. do this anymore. And mind you, during that time too, there was a change in presidential administration. Yeah. And I remember... I was, it was about a month after I came back from maternity leave and I had scheduled this meeting and we were supposed to celebrate this policy that we had been fighting for, for five years. And it didn't become that. And I don't know what I was thinking. I scheduled it the day after the election and mm -hmm. I didn't get a lot of sleep the night before. And I remember walking into that space and I've never seen my colleagues like this. People yeah. were crying. They were just beat up. I remember and it well. They were looking to me to basically be like, rah, 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 we can do it. Let's go. And I was like, I do not have it in me. And I honestly, I don't care anymore. And that's a dangerous place to be. Yeah. When your work requires you to care. And I didn't care because I was so tired. I was like, I got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And so I left. I thought I was going to take a sabbatical. Let me see if I could do this business. And I was basically flung into like, I'm going to do, let's be a coach. And let's figure this out. Yeah, so that's a very long way to like kind of talk to my story, but that's really where it started. This is how I ended up being a coach, and I was. I'm just so grateful that I've been put into different situations by a lot of people in my network to like push me. Um, so as you know, I'm no longer a health coach. I do I do other types of coaching, but that really got the ball rolling. It was mm -hmm. I'm helping everybody else, but I need to take care of myself too in my own health before you end up like your mom. Yeah. Correct. It's full circle. It was so yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always in the back of my mind. I was like, nothing should be so much that you can't, you can't show up whole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love, I love your journey because it feels like it was like the last piece of a beautiful puzzle for you to, you know, do the, add the coaching to it because everything you were describing is like the epigenetics of you know, generations and health and all the things that create their experiences. Um, and you have all that and you add the coaching to it. Yeah. How lucky, how lucky for people to get to work with you. And I love your unique perspective as a woman, you know, who's first generation, first time entrepreneur, someone who had to reinvent themselves, right? Uh, are you finding that sharing your story is what's attracting, you know, people to want that for themselves and to, to figure out their own impact and their own legacy? Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, for a lot of folks, you think that you're tracked to a certain path and 
you know, we're Gen X, right? So we've seen our mothers, like they were the first ones to go back to work and to like plow that pathway. Um, and then we're also the generation after where, you know, our parents were, you go to one job, like yeah. that is your career, right? And so this idea of like reinventing yourself and remembering what you used to dream about is really tough for a lot of folks. And I mean, I never, I, I never became a coach to be like, I want to spy in the world, right? But for me, it was like, I needed to answer that call because there was like this deep yearning in me. I was like, if I don't answer this, then what? Yeah. Right? Well, and so- Deep identity stuff. Identity. Right, it's like yeah. deep identity. It's almost like a self-abandonment if you don't answer that call. And it's, and I think if anything, it's like to give people permission to like, you don't necessarily have to take a big leap, but maybe you can go back there and revisit that piece because I know- that it's just going to linger. Like, what if, what if I didn't do that? You know, what, what, what could have been? Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's, especially women of a certain age, it's to be able to see that it's not too late. That's something that I hear across the board. Oh, it's too late. Like I should just settle. No, like we were just in a retreat and we met somebody in their seventies. And I was like, I hope you don't take anything from this, but I am so inspired by you because even at 70, you are still willing to learn and you're seeing this as your next best chapter. So it's like, it's yeah. not ending, right? No. Yeah. That was Th amazing. Thanks for promoting uh, the retreat, Noylan. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> it wasn't even planned. <laughs> but I think I, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. I mean, again, we could have you on like for months on end, you have so much good stuff to share, but I do think that's what's fascinating when we were talking one time around the idea of Gen Xers and especially women of color stepping, no longer willing to not go back in time and figure out what their dreams were and move forward with them. And the bump up you get against feeling maybe, and maybe your mom's not even necessarily saying this to you, but you could feel energetically there might be this sort of thought and, and I'm even saying your mom, but just a mom of mm -hmm. like, well, I didn't get to live my dreams, you know? And so mm -hmm. how do you manage that? And so how do you help your, do you run a, a, across that a lot with your clients? Like, do they, as they're stepping into their dreams, working with you, mm -hmm. do is there resistance or do they fall backwards sometimes because all of a sudden they, they feel bad for their mom? Yeah. Their community. Their community. Right. So it's I, even bigger than just right. Their mom. And I don't know if this is unique to women of color, to immigrants or children of immigrants, but I have found in myself as well. I want to speak from myself, but I see this in my clients too. It's like this weird push and pull. Mm. Our families, our communities, of course, want us to excel. But in your excelling, there's a little bit that you're leaving folks behind. Mm. And it's hard. It's hard to be in that place because, you know, you, when you think of goals, like, so I'm working on a project right now. And what's fascinating to me in working with these leaders is their, their triumphs, their successes, their accomplishments are not solo goals. They mm -hmm. always see it as, this is also a win for my family. This is a mm. win for my community. Um, but then there's a lot of like, yes, because the older generation, for many reasons, right? Um, we're not able to actually self, to self-actualize their mm -hmm. dreams. So you yeah. see a lot of like, like from our moms, like, I think one part of it is like, I'm so proud that our daughters do this. But, I, but on that second, I don't want to call it jealousy, but it's almost like, Hmm, I'm a little envious because you get to like live for more freely or you're like pursuing. Stuff. So it's almost like they can't believe it. Yeah. You there's know? a, there's a, a phrase that I've heard my aunts and my mom use sometimes about younger, gen but you know, it must be nice. It must be it, nice. Oh, absolutely. Or like, or just watch out because you don't ever know when the other shoe is going to drop. Like, it's like a, okay. Yeah. 
I mean, even to this day, like I've, I've, I've run my business, I'm going on seven years. And every time I get a client, my mom's like, really? They're paying? <laughs> yeah, mom. Like, I, you know, <laughs> I'm doing the thing. I'm going on vacation. I'm able to afford these things. And it's almost like, um, like I know it's a protective factor, but it's also like disbelief. Like they cannot imagine this, right? right. So you have to kind of wrestle with that all the time. You so know? When, when your mom says that, and, and and you're right, you as a coach, you know where the the well, thank God, right? But if it was right. somebody else, <laughs> but still, is there a moment where your brain goes, "This might be the last one"? Like even though oh, you've been absolutely. doing this, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if there's a little bit of triggering there, that this might be the last one or whatever, right? And then I think you know. Um, it's funny because I don't have an example. You know, right. I don't come from a lineage of entrepreneurs. Maybe the closest thing was my grandma. She was kind of a serial entrepreneur. Successful businesses, that could be questionable. She just liked to like open up businesses. But then I had to put into context. She had to open up businesses because that's the way to have a livelihood. Mm. Mm. It was like out of necessity versus for me is I get to. This right. is an expansion of you. Yeah. Right. right. And so, you know, it's like, I just feel like it's like, I'm, I'm always the first to figure this out because it was different for my mom's generation or it's different for my mom. Like even like going to school, right. My, my parents did not go to school here. So right. like I had to be the one to figure out college applications and do all of the things. Right. Um, my kids are lucky because I went through that now, but it's, it's this idea that I am the pathfinder and it dawned on me a few years ago. I was like, no, I actually come from a lineage of pathfinders. Mm. They've had to make a way, whatever it is, they've had to figure it out. They had to be solution finders in this. And so that's the lineage that I carry with me. Right. In, in doing this work, like they didn't have a roadmap. I don't have a roadmap and I have to just be okay with that. Uh, everything you're saying is making me, it's kind of giving me chills and making me think like what you're speaking to is there's belonging and scarcity, right? Mm. And I love the reframe that you're like, I, I can be the pathfinder and I'm still not alone in that Yeah. When I, when I look at it. So this must be what you're like, how do you, and, and especially for first generation families, culturally, like the belonging and the we is so strong and so powerful. We we talked about this recently, like, you know, um, what was happening in Maui, there was just such immediately amidst all of the tragedy, such a we, there was such a, like, we yeah. are going to take care of each other. It was, it, it's still to this day is kind of blowing my mind the way they take care of each other and nobody abandons anybody. And, um, and sorry, <laughs> little fuzz. Um, I, I'm imagining that's the, a lot of the work you do is helping people f still figure out their belonging and identity while they're blazing a trail and, and really yeah. work on the, like, I'm not abandoning. I'm, I'm raising the tide for everybody. Correct. That's absolutely what it is. Yeah. So interesting. And you, you do this with groups too. Yes. Yeah. Talk about that. And yeah, absolutely. And I'm, and, and I'm in the middle of a couple of projects around that. Um, you know, as, as these individuals start to get into different spaces, right, and have the opportunity to advocate on behalf of their communities, that's something that they always contend with. Um, and it's both beautiful, and it's also really hard if you're the first, the only, or the few in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, it's a different type of, it's not burden, it's a different type of responsibility that you carry in this work. And what I try to do with the, the clients and leaders that I work with is you really gotta take care of yourself. And it's even beyond stress management, right? Um, Cause you need to show up to all of these spaces that demand of you whole and resourced and replenished because a lot of things are very extractive, you know, including your family and your community, right? Could you hold a certain position within that space? Um, yeah. And so like my idea of even leadership has really evolved. It's not like the singular leader that has like this vision and is going to lead the group. It's like how does shared leadership, how does collective leadership 
look like and what I've come to learn, and even my own personal life, I grow so much more when I'm in community. Mm -hmm. And we really do need each other. To me, whether you call it traditional or ancestral, it's also a very feminine way to look at the world. Yeah. Like we are not alone, right? Your success is my success. Like I want that for you too. Um, yeah. So that's just kind of where I'm landing and just the way that we're talking about this. And um, yeah, I wish that we could do that more. I think we have a lot to learn from certain communities of, of how they care for each other. I mean, I, I agree a hundred percent. And I think, you know, obviously, as you well know, that is sort of the whole why beneath the why for the pod, for all the yeah. retreats Carrie and I have are go have done, are going to do. Because while I, I, I agree a hundred percent that my success is your success, your success is my success, like in, in community in whole, um, society tries to, cut us down at every turn and pit a get pit us against each other. Yeah. And so I think there's some sense of subconsciously, because I don't, I don't know that anybody does this consciously, but so consequently every woman sort of stays to herself mm -hmm. and, and does feel like she's going through it all by herself, yeah. you know, that she's forging a path all by herself or she's suffering with something or she's challenged by something or she's, accomplishing something all by herself and the beauty of being in community. And I know Carrie and I, Carrie agrees with me. That was what was so glorious about the best chapter yet retreat was mm -hmm. the minute you all walked in the room, you were celebrating each other and lifting each other up. And, and it was just this instant sense of whatever happens this weekend, we're all in this together, you mm -hmm. know? And, and so I love that that's the work you're doing and very specifically in the BIPOC arena, because, uh, you know, when you were saying, I don't know if this is just something that women of color deal with, there is some, I, I mean, I'm going to say maybe yes. Cause I, while my mom sort of poo pooed me becoming a coach at first, like she just needed to see one job application at a doctor's office to be like, oh, that's legitimate. Like, you know, like it was never, yeah. you know, it was never, it, she only questioned it once. And so I do think, you know, I think you guys, uh, I think women of color have a different level of challenge than white women have. And immigrant families too. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can speak again from my own experience. Um, very limited in what is the understanding of sustainable, successful careers. Uh, Doctor, lawyer, nurse. Yeah. <laughs> Filipino is a nurse, right? Like, so there's like certain paths that you're going to go to. And, and like I said, I can understand it now with, from a place of empathy. Yeah. Um, because our families have been on survival mode for so long what they're desiring is stability and security. And if that's their understanding of it, that's the place that they're coming from. And like, I could appreciate it now. Um, and you know, and now I'm also have to like, just thank my parents because they never really pushed us to go into those careers. It was more like, I just want you to have a livelihood <laughs> that you can be okay and not have to worry. You could be able to pay your bills. It was never about like to go on vacation or have these extravagant things just so that you had enough so that you could eat, you would have a roof over your heads. And that was it. This idea of like going any further and the ability to dream and think big and bold, that was new. Like we didn't, we didn't talk about that <laughs> at all. Um, but absolutely, I think in some ways, as you said, uh, Lisa, there's other things that women of color and as, as children of immigrants and immigrants that we, that we, um, think about yeah in in the pursuit of what we want to do especially what you know back to the best chapter yeah what what does that mean yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's interesting because um, my sister who came to live with us when I was six she was from Vietnam and um because she was you know for a time raised by my parents um you know for, uh, for a good chunk of her life but married into a family that had come over completely together for Vietnam. Like the clashes 
mm-hmm. in um, at first in their marriage and in that like coming together of her feeling like I can do whatever I want <laughs> or like, you know, be careful. And, and, and together they ended up being entrepreneurial, which is a great story. But like, I, I remember her experiencing this, like, oh, you know, um, his family doesn't really think women sh- or can do this, this or this, you know, so she was butting up against that. And that was interesting. Yeah. 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 So what, you know, one thing I'm thinking, I, I have one question, but then I have, I think this leads to two questions. One is thinking about your children and I know your children are young, mm-hmm. but do you get a sense already that they know anything is possible for them different from how you grew up oh absolutely yeah yeah which is beautiful so you already have like disrupted the the generational aspect of that I mean even merely what they're interested in yeah right they they love so my son loves to build and loves to draw and so does my daughter and they're very expressive in all the ways like they love singing they love dancing if I was growing up if I was them it'd be like oh that's great that's something that you just do for fun Mm. it would have never been explored as something that could be a livelihood and I also do credit my brothers my brothers I'm married to artists I'm a married to an artist and my brothers also reinvented themselves in their early 30s um and became professional artists neat and so so we have that example of folks that like broke away from what is traditional um and to pursue it and the funny story is you know my mom was a teacher for many years and so I had this story in my mind I was like oh mom she loves children she wants to help the next generation that's what she did and I didn't know until about five years ago I don't know what how we how we came to this topic? She goes, you know, what? teacher. I said, what? What do you do? Don't you love kids and teaching? And she goes, I'm gonna be really honest. I said, what did you want to be? She's like, I wanted to be an actress. And I said, why did you pursue it? Right. So, I mean, here's like my naive mind, like my American mind, like, why did you pursue your dream? And she was like, no. I said, I became a teacher because in the Philippines. That was the most affordable degree that my mm. family could put me through college for. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, what? Like you just, and she, and so it's like this idea of like unexpressed creativity in some ways I see in my mom. And, and the still- funny thing is my kids now are like, I want to wear crazy stuff, like braid my hair and put like this little thing, like this colored fake hair in it. And and I'm going to wear crazy clothes. It It's just, it's interesting, like two generations later, seeing my kids at such young ages, they're five and seven, like fully in many ways express. And we're always like really big on like, what are you feeling? I mean, this is the coach, right? What's underneath that? How do you, <laughs> you know, what do you need? <laughs> right. Um, and so to see that, I just think, wow, it is possible. Like this literally can turn around in a generation if wow. you choose to what's really impressive about your mom too is she reached for the highest thing that she thought she could that's pretty amazing and so that's what your kids are doing so yeah cool. yeah and so she loves it I think she lives like carelessly yeah. through them especially my daughter like oh she wants to be in song your, yeah, your kids just up. your kids can see the bigger container oh yeah that's amazing yeah so okay that's beautiful that's a great segue because so you your your mom did what she could do you've done it, you're allowing your children. So there's this really nice, beautiful sort of arc, right? So no, you can see the full picture. And of course, Mm. gosh, only knows what your grandchildren are going to do and so forth and so on, right? So knowing that, knowing that you can see the picture and you can see the pitfalls, when you look at the women you're working with that you serve, what vision do you have for them in creating their world and, and whatever they're going to put Mm. out. I think it's really simple. Yeah. They have to know what their desire is. Mm. Some can't even articulate what that is. Right. 
How does that show up for your clients? Like how, when, so you, cause yeah, I mean, you're yeah. a, you're a sole purpose coach. So when you start to work with somebody, what question do you ask and what kind of pushback or uh, dead silence do you get that, you know, they can't even articulate it? I actually don't get dead silence. I think part of it is that they have never been given permission to actually express. Mm. Mm. And so once you open that up, they just start dreaming. Oh. Right. And I think it's about going back to, you know, I have a five and seven year old. Their their imagination is really limitless. Mm. And to go back to whatever age that is, but to go back to an age where you dreamed and you didn't rationalize, like, is it possible? Do I have the money for this? Can I do it? And just to start from there, they can always, always tap into something. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just a matter of allowing them and giving them that space and feeling safe to be able to express it and also to support them. Like, you know, sometimes people have dreams and they have, have expressed it to people and they've been laughed at, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or like, that's just too big. It's never going to happen. I don't hold that space for them. Because I don't know, I've, I've, I've seen too many times where people have these audacious goals and it materializes, right? Yeah. right. So it's, who am I, right? I'm just there to allow you to say it out loud because there's power in just speaking it. In a right. lot and a lot of times, as we all know as coaches, it's about, it's not really about whether you can do it. It's about, are you are you doing the work so that you're able to receive it? Yeah. We oh, can yeah block that whole, that's yeah. a whole other game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good transition to what I want to get into next because you know, we've talked about desires. I want to talk about wealth, you know, like yeah. and, and let's money do stories, it. I love right? talking about money. <laughs> so, like we know as coaches, everyone's got a money story, everybody. And it's passed down, you know, it, it's a legacy, it's passed down through generations. And sometimes we don't realize we're walking around with one that's not our own. So I'm just curious, you know. I'd love to hear how you're working with your clients around the idea of empowerment and wealth and impact and, and the right to that. Mm -hmm. It's super hard. I will say that because money is such a tricky topic for a lot of people. And <clears throat> Carrie, you and I are similar because we used, we used to be in nonprofit spaces. Right. And I think there's a certain ethos in those spaces of service and of giving, 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 right? And that those individuals shouldn't be paid because it's like a weird conundrum to be in, right? You're helping people in many instances who are financially um, struggling and you wanna be down for the cause. And so for some reason, people are not getting paid even though they have a background uh, they have expertise, they have special skills, but they're not fairly being compensated. And then for those individuals to then start to think about, I actually need to get paid more, right? Beyond just like bare minimum to get by. Like, that's what I grew up with. Like, you right. don't need that much. You just need enough, right? It's about what um, you need. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. that whole, like, you know, I've worked with a couple of clients who have left the public sector and then are now like consultants or doing something in the in the in the private sector. And the 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 jump in salary is so massive. I don't think what people realize is that you have to be ready to receive it because there's sometimes a certain level of uh I feel guilty. I yes, feel guilty for taking this money. That right? imposter syndrome just hits hard. Total yeah. imposter syndrome. And then also, you know, uh, what does it mean if I take this? I'm, am, am I going to like be subsumed? Because we have these like narratives about like people with money are greedy. And no, like I've actually had to work with folks. I was like, if you are a generous person, a kind person, I see money as an amplifier. Mm -hmm. It will only allow you to do that more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my meditation um, teachers, uh, Grandmaster Chowa uh, Koksui, he says, money in the hands of good people can change the world. Mm -hmm. So you have to believe that if you're inherently good, it's just going to amplify that. It's going to allow you to do more good. 
Um, and so that's, that's a lot of like the reframe, right? We got to look at money as energy. It's an energetic exchange, especially if you're starting your own business, like, oh, am I going to charge this? this? This feels weird. And I don't want to be cringy. You get to decide how you do this. You don't, you don't, you don't have to do it. Like how all these like business coaches are telling you, like that's their model and it works. You also get to decide how that is. And I know for me, and I've worked with Lisa on this, so I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, in the last couple of years, my coaching and consulting practice has really just like took off. And I remember uh, just having to work because I was getting paid a certain amount of money. And so that was like my ceiling for a long time. I was comfortable. It was fine. Right. Of course, I wanted more. But then when the money came, I was like, what's wrong with me, Lisa? Right. <laughs> I remember I really that call. got to work on the, the receiving piece. Right. Yeah, it's tough. It's like you have to allow yourself to receive. And sometimes I have to take clients out of like the actual money as like, how are other ways are you receiving? Mm -hmm. Like if somebody pays you a compliment, do you like diminish it? Be like, oh, thank you for this. I got it on sale at TJ Maxx. Yeah. Like, you don't have to say that. Like, thank you, right? It's My like, husband thinks every woman does that. Can I help you? No, I got it. And you're like lugging this big thing, right? Like, no, let people. Let people help you allow yourself to receive these little things. And I think it, it starts with that, like, like little ways to practice. And if money's just symbolic of it, where can we practice that in our lives? Getting help, right? Mm -hmm. Taking a compliment and giving your price and just stepping back because you know that you bring a unique perspective and that you, you are worth that money. Um, starting a business and money just tells you so much about yourself. Mm. So many ways. I love it. So then this leads us to leadership. Again, we could go on and on and on and on for days. You have so much great stuff to share, but you do a lot of work supporting and inspiring leadership skills, helping existing leaders to grow in confidence and scope. Um, I know the things you're planning on doing since we work together that I'm super excited about that we'll bring you back for, but just tell me or us a little bit about the, the work you do in, in that realm. Yeah. Um, leadership is a funny term, right? When you look out there, it'll be like on Forbes and like different places, like what makes a good leader, right? Yeah. Somebody who's charismatic and can lead a team and it's very forceful. I like good decision makers. And yes, to some degree, I, I believe in that. But, you know, again, I work with predominantly people of color. Mm -hmm. And in many communities, leadership is looked at so differently. Oftentimes in some communities, it's not like when you think of a leader, it's not male. Yeah. It's actually the woman. You know, the woman has like a very significant role in the family, in the community. They're looked at as, as the sages and the guides. Mm. And in some communities too, it's collective leadership. We have to actually talk about this and look at it together. And so for me, I've really just come to learn that each person has to define that in themselves. What does being a good leader mean? But I believe that part of it is to really know who you are mm. and what you value. And that's the place that you move from. Mm. And if you're not clear on that, there's no way that you can lead others in any way. And also I feel like a leader is both leading and following is a student and a teacher. And a guide. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because I cannot respect somebody that thinks that they know it all. We always can learn. We can always learn about something. Um, and I also do believe that there has to be a melding of this understanding of leadership. It's both the masculine qualities, goal-oriented, action-oriented, decisive. But there are instances where that is just not gonna work. We have to bring in the feminine qualities of nurturing each other, community, right? Pacing, even this understanding like, not everything is urgent. There is a cycle and a time for everything. And so I've really leaned on it. And I feel like it's it's kind of across the board. You see it in a lot of communities. And in some ways, it's really ancestral knowledge. Um, yeah. 
And look at the world these days. I think we can use a little bit more of that type of you think? collective nurturing energy that we are in this together. We do not need to be like one upping each other all the time. I yeah. like that you just said learning because I keep hearing when you're saying that, I keep thinking like listening, Li really yeah. good leaders need to listen. They need to listen so that they can yeah. model how to pivot. Yeah. Yeah. And to that point, I feel like a really good leader is someone who knows how to pivot mm -hmm. and it's not, not necessarily adapting, but pivoting. The pandemic showed us that like there were some leaders I was like, oh, wow, I was not expecting this. And I was coaching them. I thought that they were like, wow, they're like so strong. No, you have to learn how to just like pivot mm. and in a lot of ways redefine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would make sense. Yeah. I feel like that's a really strong quality and in, in, in good leaders. Yeah. I always like to say it's, it's living in the question and not have needing to have answers um, is, is where we find true leadership. Like I, I yeah. don't have an answer for that. We're going to live with this question and see how it goes <laughs> because we know our values and we know who we are. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm, that's really powerful. Um, I love the work that you're doing. You know, these re the retreats you're doing um, for groups, the work you're doing with individuals. Um, I am, I'm, I'm really blown away by how much this is needed. Mm -hmm. I know you take a lot of inspiration from a lot of places. And I think you brought a quote to share with us. Would you mind sharing that with us yeah. about, about that? Yeah, sure. So this quote is by Grace Lee Boggs. And I, when I think about Grace Lee Boggs, she was a really a futurist in some ways in the way that she did organizing, that way that she did activism. Um, so I quote her a lot, but this one in particular really struck me. So it goes, the time has come for us to reimagine everything. We have to reimagine work and go away from labor. We have to reimagine revolution and get beyond protest. We have to think not only about change in our institution, but changes in ourselves. Wow, full body chills on that. I know it's gonna yeah. say snaps, full <laughs> yeah. body chills on that one. Holy moly, Love that it. is beautiful. And if I may, that is your work in a nutshell. You absolutely, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm that, you know, we normally have a song that we quote and you were like, oh, I have a, can I do a quote instead? And I'm so glad you did because that is mm -hmm. exactly indicative of you and the work you're doing. And I'm just, I'm so happy we're friends and that we work together. Likewise, <laughs> I, I have the same love and appreciation for you both. <laughs> I'm looking at you and thinking like, you're like this peaceful revolution all in one. Mm, Ooh, love I that. <laughs> <laughs> That feels exactly right, Carrie. What a beautiful yeah. reflection. Yeah, it's it's beautiful energy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, do you have any final thoughts? I mean, we've shared a lot. And and again, Carrie and I do this every time. We're like, wait, we need to bring you back. And we will. Yeah. Um, but anything else you want our listeners to know about your work? Yeah. Um, I would just say the one thing I will leave is so much magic happens in community. So I hope the listeners can find their community of care and their community of practice to journey on, on this life with. That's what we need. We need many of those. Um, so that's what I will leave. Mm. Perfect. Mm. Just give me chills. <laughs> Thank you so much for being You're here, welcome. Noelin, taking time from your small children and your fabulous work and your time to be with us. I really appreciate it. Um, we are going to post links to Noyland and her work in the show notes and on our Instagram and Facebook page. Is there anything else in particular like you that I didn't mention where we could link people to you? Sure. Um, you can follow me on Instagram and that's at the radiant and then you letter U. Um, you can link that way. We sign up for my newsletter. You can visit my website and link that way. So www.theradiantu, again, letter u.com. Yeah, looking forward to connecting with folks. Yay. Well, as always, everyone, we're so grateful you listened. I'm sure you got a ton out of hearing from Neuland. And if any of this landed, 
or all of it landed and you can think of somebody else you'd like to share this episode with, please do. Um, again, I'm very excited. This whole month is just powerhouse women. Uh, of course, we chose International Women's Month to have all these powerhouse women on. And so next week we have Tressa Pope and she is going to bring, um, I, I don't even want to necessarily say what she's doing, but what she's going to talk about around women and again, mostly a lot about women of color and and their resistance to home ownership and the stuff that comes up around that. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful um, part two in some ways to what we just talked about with you here. Yeah. Well, and Lisa said what I was going to say, which is if you found it inspiring, please consider sharing it. Um, and always be sure to like and follow the pod so that you don't miss an episode wherever you listen. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. I always get so messy.